take your Bibles, if you wouldn't, turn to Mark the ninth chapter. Mark the ninth chapter. While you're doing that, I have a question for you. And the question is, how many of you like your name? Oh, that's pretty good. All right. And what's really interesting, uh, how many of you did not like your name at some point in time when you were growing up? Yeah, yeah, just about the same amount, all right? It kind of changes as we go along. And the fact is, a lot of us don't like our name at some point in time because of how our parents used it. You know, I, I, I heard my mom say, Michael Edward Cook, get in here right now. You know, you got some explaining to do. And so she always called me that whenever I was in deep trouble. Michael Edward Cook. So the first name is Michael, but I want you to write this down because most of you don't know it. You spell Michael, M-I-K-E-L, not M-A-C-H-A-E-L or any other way that they do that. And so my name has always been special. And to be honest with you, it's been a real pain through the years because anywhere I go, they always misspell it. They never, they never get it right. But you know what? I found out from my dad that had I been born 30 days later, uh, my name would probably not have been Michael Edward Cook because my dad's brother had already decided he was going to name his firstborn that name but she happened to be a girl and so because of that then dad stole the name to which actually my brother did not forgive him for a long period of time and so but I got that name. But my name hasn't been static, and yours, yours probably hasn't either. You know, for the first 10 years of my life, I probably went by the term of Mikey, okay, until I got like this. And then people didn't call me Michael anymore. They started calling me Cookie <laughs> because I, I started doing a lot more of that. But then when I got to high school, I had a high school coach, and <laughs> I, remember, I remember when he called me Cook. For crying out loud, you did it again. You know, just something that wasn't right one more, one more time. I was even called good looking. But that was so long ago, so long ago, right? Uh, but when I went to college, my professors decided to call me by my actual name. So they started calling me Michael. Now, I love that name today because every time I get a call and it's a telemarketer, I can tell immediately that it's a telemarketer. Because if you look at my name and you look at it for the very first time, to them it says Mikkel. That's how they do it. So, you know, I get the call and I get the call. Well, is Mikkel Cook there? And I go, no, he doesn't live here. And I hang up. You know, because that's true. Mikkel Cook doesn't live here. You know, it's Michael. In the 60s, Kath and I had a little addition to our home, our daughter Amber. And from that time on, I got another name. And that name was Daddy. About 32 years ago, I can't believe that, 32 years ago, I got a new name, and it was Papa, because now I'm, I was a grandfather, as opposed to the times when Kath would call me Grumpy. You know, she's just grumpy. Uh, a pastor was asked if he ever woke up grumpy, and he replied, well, sometimes, and sometimes I'll let her sleep in. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a different story. And uh, by the way, she looked at me. I won't be sharing that one again. All right. So, so I went to work. I went to work in my first church, you know, as a senior pastor around 1980 or so. And from that time on, most of my life, I've just been called pastor. And it's a great honor. And I thank you when you when you do that. But I'm not really defined by my name. I'm not. Even though I like it now, it's different. You know, and it's kind of like me. You know, hardly anybody would say, you know, if you describe me as a person, as your pastor, hardly anybody wouldn't say, you know, he's different, uh, and, and I'm okay with that. But that said, this leads up to our message this morning. Our scripture begins in Mark the ninth chapter from an interesting story. Jesus and his apostles had come to Capernaum, and Jesus was teaching a, a lesson about the kingdom. And all of a sudden, John comes into the room, and we pick up the story in Mark, the ninth chapter, verse 38. Teacher, John said, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Remember a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about the 12 apostles, those, those guys who followed Jesus so closely, and I, I mentioned to you how Jesus had nicknamed two of the guys, James and John, Sons of Thunder. And the reason he did that was because John wanted to call down fire from heaven and burn up a bunch of people in Samaria because they didn't greet Jesus like he thought they should, all right? And now he's going farther yet. He, now he's forbidding people to even do something good in Jesus' name. Sounds a little bit like the Pharisees, doesn't it? 
They were constantly on his show, on, you know, on coming after him, going after him, going after him. And all he was doing was doing good. But John, he's trying to stop him. I don't want you to do anything like this. And we don't know what the issue was. The Bible doesn't tell us. Maybe John thought the guy was out of line. You know, he didn't know him. He assumed that Jesus didn't know him. And he assumed that he didn't really know Jesus. So we don't know who the guy was. But the point is, whoever this stranger was, he was outside the circle of John's comfortable. You know, do you ever get that? You got this comfortable group that you're with, and when somebody else comes in from the outside, you're just going, eh, you know, just, it feels a little bit weird. And so this guy was outside of that circle. Now, if anybody had a right to be cranky about somebody else using his name, it should have been Jesus. But look at what he says in verse 39. It says, do not stop him, Jesus said. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Now, I want to share something with you. Whenever you find a passage of scripture and you go, I really like that passage. You need to understand that's probably not the only passage of scripture that deals with this. And so you need to take all of these things into consideration. And we have to understand, you know, as we look at this, uh, does, does that mean that anybody, you know, because that's what he said, right? Whoever is not against us is for us. As anybody, anybody, does that mean anybody who lays claim, who has ever laid claim to Jesus, should be considered as a card-carrying Christian, or at least their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? But as I said, like any other scripture, it has to be taken in a group. It can't be taken in just isolation because there are other scriptures that come into play as well. The fact is in Matthew the seventh chapter, it says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did, not, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then look what he says. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. He gives another warning in, in the book of Mark, the 13th chapter. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. And then he says, and they will deceive many. So it appears on one hand that Jesus is saying, if they use my name, they are one of me. And on the other hand, it seems like he's saying, but be careful, not everybody who uses my name is one of me. So there's a big contrast here. So what's going on? Well, in your outline, you might want to pull that out. The first point that's in there is we need to realize that his name is descriptive. This, this name of Jesus is descriptive. Shakespeare said, if you call a rose by a different name, it didn't make it a different thing. But by the same token, calling something a rose isn't, that it isn't a rose is not going to make it a rose. That make sense? And that's what he was trying to get across. But when the gospel writers talk about the very name of Jesus, they were talking about a very specific Jesus. And this is important for us to know because there's a lot of people out there, a lot of different groups out there that talk about the name of Jesus, but they're not talking about the Jesus that we're talking about. Because the Jesus who we're describing is a Jesus who always was and always is. It's a Jesus who not only was the Son of God, but is God. It was the Jesus who was born of a virgin, the Jesus who lived a sinless life, the Jesus who died on the cross, the Jesus who was raised from the dead, and that Jesus will someday return. That's the Jesus as far as the name in the Bible is concerned, all right? And that is a Jesus in the Bible, and many churches around the world embrace that Jesus, they're in love with that Jesus. But there's a number of folks out there, that's not the Jesus they're talking about. If someone handed you a tulip and said it was a rose, you and I would right away know that's not a rose. But only if you knew what a rose looked like. However, if you'd never seen a rose, it's possible you would think the flower you'd been handed indeed was a rose. And you might even tell other people it was a rose, but would that make it a rose? No. And so we have churches and those who are part of churches who say, here is Jesus. So they're going to describe their Jesus. And they say, but he's not the Jesus who was born of a virgin. Because we don't believe that. And he would say, he's not the Jesus who was the son of God. Because we don't believe that. And he's not the Jesus who was raised from the dead or who will return again. Because we just can't 
believe that. See, then I would tell you that you're looking at a tulip and not a rose. You're not looking at the original. And so understand, it's not enough to claim just the name of Jesus to be able to walk around and say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I claim the name of Jesus without claiming the Jesus of that name and know what the Bible says about who he is. Also, the second thing, you need to understand his name is holy. It's holy. This goes back to what we believe about Jesus. If we truly believe that he is God, then his name deserves the same respect as the name of God. What kind of respect is that? Well, you've got to go back to Exodus 20. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. To misuse God's name is to use it in a thoughtless manner. So a lot of people I need to be able to share with them when they talk about Jesus, it's not an exclamation of disgust because that's how a lot of people use it or a statement of surprise or even a statement of anger or an excuse for another cuss word that we just decided to use in this particular way. It's a holy name and it deserves to be treated as such. That is important for us as we speak because it's not just a command about speaking, but it's also a command about being concerned in the way that we live. When you call yourself a Christian, then you're calling yourself a follower of Christ. And you are, in effect, taking the name and attaching that name to yourself with your behavior. And when your life does not reflect your commitment as a Christian, then you are misusing his name. So when you call yourself a Christian and then you live like hell... What does that say? What are you doing to the name of Christ when you're living that way? We need to understand it's more than just words. It's also our behavior. Which leads me to the third thing, and that is his name is powerful. And this is the part that I, I really, really love. His name is powerful. You read through the book of Acts. And as you're reading through that book, you discover that the early church depended on the name of Jesus. It was a dependence. It was in the name of Jesus that the message of the gospel was preached. It was in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that people were healed. It was in the name of Jesus that tyrants were rebuked. It was in the name of Jesus that people found the strength to actually be martyred for their faith. And there are great scriptures that we can claim, great scriptures we ought to hold on to. For instance, John 14, 14, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Well, I mean, how often have we heard that promise? How often maybe have we claimed that promise? And you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Man, the first time I heard that, I went, wow, wow. But did Jesus actually mean you can ask me for anything in my name? and it would be yours. That you and yours would never be in want. You never have a need. All you gotta do is ask Jesus. He'll take care of it. You would never be sick, right? Just bring it before Jesus. He'll take it away immediately. Uh, you know, that, that you could ask for whatever you want in Jesus' name and it would be yours. And it's interesting, sometimes that's how it is preached. You just go out and whatever you want, it is yours. And I can share with you, if that's your understanding of that passage, that's a mockery of the words of Jesus. It's not true. Seriously, you can't cherry pick verses like this and, and just let them stand on their own. You, you can't just take a sentence out of the Bible and look at it in isolation. The very least you could do is take some of the passages that are around it to help you figure out what it meant. So in John 14, verse 12, it says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. That's an important statement. And then they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So what's he talking about here? He's talking about doing, you know, whatever Jesus did. You want to ask God for something? Ask God for something based upon that. This is what Jesus did, that your prayers and your life would bring glory to God. And so I have people all the time saying, well, you know, okay, I can understand that, but, you know, if I prayed to win the lottery, wouldn't that bring glory to God? 
My answer to that is perhaps. But the other side of it is, do you really believe that? That, that that's what gives God glory? I, I looked it up. Do you know about 70% of people who win a lottery or get a big windfall actually end up broke in a few years? Totally broke. And there isn't much happening in the spiritual realm of these folks once they get a lot of bucks in their hands. And that might happen to you and me as well. That's why I never win the lottery. You got to buy tickets first, I understand, but I never win the lottery. So this teaching goes back to the line in the Lord's Prayer that says, your will be done on heaven as it is in earth. There is power in Jesus' name. And that power is living in Jesus' name. And this means that we live in such a way that our requests are requests that Jesus would honor. That's so important. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. How will he give it? You're going to bear fruit. What kind of fruit? The fruit will last. The kinds of things that Jesus would have done. And God said, there's no limit on what I'll give you. No limit. And we like the last part of that verse, you know, where it says, the Father will give you whatever you ask for in my name. But you can't isolate that from the first part of Jesus' statement. And that is you, you have to bear fruit that will last because that is what your request and your prayer is supposed to lead to, to lead to fruit that will last. And when you pray for the power and desire to live the life that Jesus would have you to live, that power is there. When you pray for the strength to resist temptation, that strength is there. When you pray that you will be better able to bear the name of Jesus and your life will be producing the fruit that Jesus wants you to produce, that request will be honored. It will. You know, I, I once thought praying, uh, you know, with, with this additional line, this addendum, praying, your will be done, was a bit of a cop-out. And I always thought it was a cop-out because if we were truly praying in faith, believing that whatever we asked for in Jesus' name would happen, then saying your will be done was just giving ourselves an out. Because if, if we're praying your will be done, if our prayers weren't answered, then you could just say, eh, you know, it wasn't God's will. It wasn't God's will for it to happen. So let me ask, if you truly believe that God is smarter than us, okay, and sometimes I don't think we do. But if you truly believe that God is smarter than us and that he wants his will to be done through us and that ultimately God wants the very best for our lives, even if at this point in our lives it doesn't seem that way, do you truly believe that? Do you really believe it? See, sometimes we're like children who feel that we need every shiny new toy that captures our imagination. It's like a little child, you know, you go into, what is it, a basket robins, how many flavors do they have? What is it, 51 or something? 31, 31 okay. I got a lot, I, I don't go in there, but they, they got a lot, I know. You can, t you can tell by the way I look, I don't go in there, I got that, all right. But, you know, sometimes as, as kids, they go in there, and they, what do they want? They want all of it, right? Whatever flavor that's there. Or you go, into a, you, know, you go into a grocery store. Don't you love those little things right at the very end where you're checking out and it has like 40 different candy bars in front of you? And so they want all the candy bars. Anything that tickles my fancy. That's what we do. That's how we seem to act. And that does not bring glory to God. But have you ever wondered what would happen if every prayer that you uttered had been answered just the way you wanted it to be answered? There would be a lot of trouble going on right now. It's possible you wouldn't even be married to the person you're married to. Because you may have said at some particular time, Lord, I'd really like to be married to that person. Uh, but God didn't see that was right. And so he didn't answer that. Not the way you wanted him to answer. The power that is in the name of Jesus is the power to live as a new creation in Christ. The power to be a witness to his name. The power to bear the fruit that he would have us to bear. And Paul wrote these words to believers in Colossians Church. It says in third chapter, And whatever you do, whether you do it in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 
There is power in the name of Jesus. I've watched as the sick have been healed. I've watched as, as uh, the, um, the fever in a young boy was, was just broken immediately after the prayer. I've watched all kinds of amazing things that have happened. But all those things were done in a situation that was for God's glory. It wasn't to make Mike look good. It wasn't to, to just, just bring a boy back. It was because God said, you offer this prayer and you're doing it in Jesus' name and you're doing it for the right motives, I'm going to honor it for you. That's amazing when that happens. You know, the supplies that Kath and I have been given over the years, you know, talked about it before, going off to Bible college, you know, uh, we've got three kids, had a fourth one while we were in, while we were in college, you know, and we, we made hardly anything, but every month there was something that came in that took care of our bills. Why? Because we were doing what God asked us to do and God honored that. So it's important that we understand there is power in the name of Jesus. But you got to use it for the right reason and the right purpose. And he's not going to give you that new BMW or that new Porsche or that new vet just because you like it. You know. In fact, it's more than likely he'll give you a 30-year-old Toyota. All, right. All things can be done through Christ Jesus, but we have to do it in a way that honors him. Amen. Amen. Communion time is another way that we honor the Lord. And in our communion time today, we, we celebrate that. And it's kind of interesting, on a day like today, there'll be Christians all over the world who will be celebrating. Some call it, uh, when they do this, some call it the Eucharist. Other people call it the Lord's Supper. Other people call it communion. But it's a ceremony that, that both unites and divides Christians. It expresses our, commun our common faith in Christ, yet at the same time, various aspects of this ceremony has caught a lot of controversy. I mean a lot. For example, you all right? <laughs> For example, a lot of people have a controversy about when should it be celebrated? You know, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly? And there are churches that split because of when it should be celebrated. Uh, there's churches that broke in half because they were really upset about who administered it. You know, can we have regular people stand at the table? Or is it just those who wear a cross around their neck and, you know, some kind of garb? Who can do it? Who should take part? Uh, we were in church a long, long time ago with my mom and dad. We went to this particular church and sat down and they had a service and they just happened to have a communion that day. And so they started passing around and the guy looked at dad and said, do you belong to this church? Dad said, no, we're just visiting. He wouldn't let him take communion. By the way, we got him walked out. That's the way my dad acts. And he wasn't wrong by doing that. So, you know, who should take it? There's even this big question about, well, what about the bread? Should it be unleavened bread, regular bread, you know, whole wheat, rye? What, you know, what should it be? Now, some other individuals talk about, well, can it actually be wine? Because, you know, we're not really supposed to take wine. I don't know where you found that, but, you know, just what goes on. And what happens to the bread and to the wine once it's blessed? Because there's a big controversy about whether or not this is the blood and body of Christ or this represents the blood and the body of Christ. And here's what I found. And all of that controversy, all it does is sidetrack the central issue. And the central issue is this is to be done in the name of Jesus for a sacrificial death that he did for us. I don't think you have to add any more to that. All these other things are all peripheral. They don't really make a difference. See, communion is fundamentally about Jesus. Focusing on Jesus helps us to avoid being distracted by the side issues. 
So Jesus instituted community, uh, com communion as a way for his disciples to remember his death and his sacrifice. And at its core, communion is a celebration. It's a remembrance of what Christ has done for us. It reminds us and it declares to us, those that are partaking, that, that Christ loves us and he is alive in us because of what he has done. The fact is, in Luke, the 22nd chapter, it says, Jesus is speaking. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples, they reclined at the table. And so he says to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And then after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this, divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And then he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. See, some people will read that passage and when I say, you know, would you open up those little communion deals and would you take the bread? They're going, wait, wait. It says they took the, the drink first. They just got sidetracked again. It doesn't make any difference what goes first or what goes last. These kind of things, you want something after them just to get them down, all right? But this just simply represents the body of Christ. So would you take that as we remember today? the juice of course the juice represents the blood the blood that was shared and so as you take this remember what it cost for you to have forgiveness let's do